Luftgekult is a word you hear a lot in the Porsche community, and it literally means air-cooled. Luft is air, gekult is the past participle of coolen or to cool. So there you go, Luftgekult. Now you're educated and you speak a little more German than you used to. <laughs> The alternative would be Wassergekult, which is pretty much what every other car you drive is. You know, these have radiators and coolant. So what's the difference? How do these work? Well, we're gonna talk about how they work, why they work, what's good about them, and why we don't use them anymore. But first, thank you to my Patreon supporters. Greatly appreciate it, especially during these weird times because every dollar counts. But let's get into it. On a typical car, Let's take my M3 for example. Let's pop the hood. The basic premise of how every water-cooled engine works is around each cylinder you've got a water jacket. That's gonna be a cavity where coolant is flowing. That allows for fluid to go in, absorb the heat around those cylinder walls, and then they can cool themselves by going through the radiator and the grills are gonna feed the radiator and that's going to allow this cycle to continue. Now there's more to it because you, in addition to your radiator, you've also got a heater core and that's how you heat the cabin in water-cooled cars. So all the air that's blowing over that super hot heater core is just going to get blown into the cabin so that way you can stay warm. That's where your heat comes from. This also means that your water-cooled cars operate in a very narrow temperature range. So we've got a thermostat. When you start the car, it's not circulating fluid through that radiator. It's going to just stay within the engine. And once it gets up to a certain temperature, that thermostat will open up and allow fluid to flow through the radiator and then maintain a certain temperature. Air-cooled cars operate in a larger temperature range, which in one respect means that they're slightly more robust as far as the engine goes, but in another it means that they are harder to control for emissions because the temperature fluctuation means that you're not controlling the mixture quite as much. That's one strike against the air-cooled cars for modern use. If we jump under the hood of this Porsche 911, probably one of the more common cars you see with an air-cooled engine, other than a Volkswagen Beetle, I guess we don't really think too much about buses and Corvairs. But the premise is simple. You have a flat six under here, doesn't have to be, but in this case it is, and there is a fan. That fan, its only job is to blow air down over the cylinders. And unlike the cylinders on a water-cooled car, there's no water jackets. They look more like a Harley. Instead of being surrounded by that nice cool water jacket, each cylinder is in a jug and those jugs have fins. Those fins allow air to pass over them and evacuate heat. So why then is it called an air-cooled car and not an oil-cooled car? Well, those of you who will argue semantics are somewhat right, but mostly wrong, because the primary effect of cooling comes from the air. There is the added benefit of allowing oil to help cool this as well, and I'll show you that right now. The 911 has a little trick up its sleeve to help it cool a little further if it needs it. So after about 180 or 190 degrees Fahrenheit, there's a thermostat. Now, that thermostat is gonna allow oil to flow along these lines under the car, these oil lines. There's a feed and return line, and up front, there's an oil cooler. So just like you might have a radiator on a water-cooled car, there's a big oil cooler up here, and that allows oil to be circulated to the front of the car, get cooled down, and then find its way back to the engine. So then how does cabin heat work in an air-cooled car? Well, we don't have a heater core to blow air over like we do in a water-cooled car, so instead we actually use the heat from the exhaust. So that's why you will often see the exhaust referred to on air-cooled 911s as heat exchangers. Let's get it up on the ramps and I'll show you underneath the car for a better look. So you can see by this exhaust manifold, this is not just a straight pipe coming out of the exhaust and out of the car. It's actually got this like 
enclosed area and that enclosed area allows you to exchange heat. So there are pipes in that enclosed area and air will move over those hot pipes and blow into the cabin when you ask it to. So why don't we use air-cooled engines in modern cars? Well, if you've noticed with companies like Singer, they spend big money trying to make like modern day power out of air cooled engines. And that's because these can only take so much power before they are too hot to, to function. The complexity of a water cooled engine is important to control heat management. And we really just lack that heat management when we've got an air cooled engine. So for example, if you had a water cooled engine and your thermostat was stuck closed, if you couldn't circulate coolant through that radiator, you would end up with an overheating issue very, very quickly. These cars are extremely sensitive, right? They're not going to function very well if they don't have the appropriate cooling. I think he just blew the car up. So with air-cooled engines, they function fine within a realm of temperatures, but after, after a certain amount of power, you end up generating so much heat that it can no longer function. So it ends up costing an extraordinary amount of money in order to, to develop an air-cooled car that would actually produce, you know, four or 500 horsepower, which is exactly why Singers cost so damn much. <laughs> And that's exactly why Porsche had to go to a water-cooled system when it came to the 996, because at that point they had really exhausted the capabilities of their air-cooled technology for the money. If you wanted to continue building air-cooled engines and stay competitive in the market like the 996 was at, you know, 400 horsepower, you would have to spend so much money on the engine that it's, it wouldn't really be marketable. <laughs> At that point, you'd probably end up costing double what a Ferrari would cost, and people would just say, wow, the Ferrari is a bargain. And uh, those who want to stick with air coolers can do so, but they just have to spend, you know, three quarters of a million dollars with an independent company like Singer. So there you have it, Luftgekult, these air-cooled cars, are a lot more simple than their water-cooled brethren, but they can't make the same amount of power and stay competitive in a modern market, and they also are not very efficient because it's harder to control mixture and they end up burning a little more fuel than a more controlled and complex system. I hope this clears up some of the questions about how an air-cooled car works Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one. What are you still doing here? Oh, all right, you drank my Kool-Aid and now you're wondering why in 1987, Ruff managed to build the CTR Yellow Bird with like 500 horsepower and Porsche was building the 993 Turbo with 400 horsepower. And you know what, don't make fun of my sheets. I'm in quarantine at my parents' house. This is not my room. So I tried to do some research on the rough CTR Yellowbird because I'm not totally sure what they changed in that engine. I assume they used a lot of very expensive materials and keep in mind that that car cost $223,000 new in 1987. That's a lot of money. So clearly a lot of efforts were put into that car to let it be reliable or I don't know if it was reliable.
And remember, it's not just about making that power. It's about making that power in a drivable package that's compliant with EPA standards and is still reliable. Porsche's air-cooled engines were single overhead cam with two valves per cylinder. So you can imagine that they needed to update their design to compete as a performance car at the late 90s and early 2000s. They couldn't rely on this archaic stuff of the past. So while it's certainly possible to make big power out of these air-cooled engines, they probably wouldn't have the drivability that you'd be looking for in a modern supercar. They'd probably be really expensive and you just wouldn't want to deal with the hassle. You just go spend half the money and buy the Ferrari.